All right, David Moore, Equity Advantage. And I just wanna thank Shelly Pennington for the opportunity to speak this morning. I, I hear, I see, uh, got a message, Morris. Uh, sorry, if you can't make it, you can't make it, but uh, we'll catch up. Hope everyone's uh, starting off to, they're, they're saying not to have a happy new year, but to have a better year. And I hope everyone out there's doing that. We've got one hour to cover the, a lot of 1031 information. We're gonna talk about section 121 as well. We're gonna talk a little bit about holding periods because in, in the times of COVID, I think it's really important to understand that despite all that information out there, there is no stated required hold in section 1031. So, you know, let's imagine you've got somebody that bought something and, uh, you know, just pre-crash or pre, not, shouldn't say pre-crash, pre-COVID. And uh, now their tenants haven't been paying them and now they don't want the property. And, and somebody's told them, well, you got to hold it a year or two years to have a defendable tax deferred exchange. And that's just totally incorrect. So, you know, the idea when you're buying a property with 1031 is it's your intent to hold it for investment. Uh, what they don't want to see you doing is flipping properties without tax, uh, paying tax in that situation. So if, if you've got a situation, maybe it's you, maybe it's a client that bought something and now the world's changed and they're looking to get rid of the thing, uh, make a difference, uh, go into something else. Maybe they have to, maybe they just want to. Uh, there's really no stated hold in the code. We'll talk about that and what I'd recommend in a few minutes. But you know, the idea is this class is gonna go over all the basics of the process and give you some examples at the end. We've got an hour to get through and it's an hour full of information. Uh, I probably will not be getting to questions during this presentation if you've got them. Uh, if you look at the menu on the right side of your screen, there's, there's a, a bar down at the bottom that says questions. If we get done early, I'll, I'll address those. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll address those with response. Celia in my office is going to be issuing the, the CE for today's class. And if you've got questions, by all means ask. The only dumb question is the one that's not asked. So this class, once again, is, is an application-based uh, class. You know, my background, I grew up in California, moved here in 1990 to buy property. And after my brother and I got here, we, we needed exchange work done, found nobody was here. And so we put Equity Advantage together in 1991 to handle investment needs. And, and I just like to put it out there that 1031 is, is not a tax or, or legal decision. It, it's an investment decision. You do it for one reason. You do it to keep your money uh, working for you. And, and unlike Wall Street, where you've got uh, you know, roughly $32 trillion in qualified, that means IRA or 401k funds in Wall Street, uh, that stuff... Uh, automatic has has an automatic rollover via you know the tax deferral nature of a 401k or or a an ira and if you look at what's in there and any financial advisor will tell you well you should you should be uh, diversified in your investments uh, two percent of that money is in real estate so that doesn't sound like a, a very diversified number if you or your clients have any needs maybe you're talking to somebody some uh, gathering well we, we used to have gatherings Maybe it's online, but you know the deal is if somebody says, "Hey, you know, I've I've got uh, I'd like to go out and buy some uh, real estate, but I don't have the money to do it." Well, maybe they do. Maybe they've got it in their retirement accounts. We can self-direct those accounts to get into real estate. That's another class. Be happy to talk to you about. But the idea is 1031 is sort of you know the IRA or 401k for real estate. And the, and the beauty of it is, unlike retirement accounts, anything that goes into a retirement account, you're going to pay normal income tax at some point on. Where 1031, you can elect to kick that uh, tax obligation down the road as long as you choose to do that. And at least in today's world, we've got stepped up basis. Now, keep, you know, keep your eyes peeled with respect to what's going to happen with the new administration. One of the things they talk about is getting rid of the stepped up basis. Also talked about uh, elimination of 1031 or... Uh, tightening up where they would only allow 1031s for people that made under $400,000 a year. And your first thought might be, gee, that's me. That's a lot of my friends. We don't have to worry about it. 1031's there. Well, think about any time you sell a property, the gain on that property gets put on top of what you make in a given tax year. And I'd put it out there. There's not many people that are going to be able to do an exchange if they cap it to people that make 400 or less. So that's something we're really worried about with respect to, I, I'm probably less concerned with 1031 going away than them sort of pitting us against one another and throwing something like that at us. 
Uh, keep your eyes peeled. Next month, we're going to have a presentation by Inland uh, Private Capitals, uh, their, their uh, political uh, liaison, and, and he's going to be talking about what's going on in that, that situation with tax reform and also talk about 1031. Their position right now is that the, the Biden administration is going to be busy enough with health care. They're not really going to get the taxes till uh, maybe next fall. And then they're going to have to be looking at mid midterm elections once again and wanting to maintain their control of stuff. So they're sort of thinking the 1031 is not something that is in the chopping block. I hope it's not. But as, as far as uh, current information, as soon as we get anything on it, we're going to get it out to you. So 1031, for those of you that are sort of new to it, it's been around. It's 100 years old. I mean, almost 100 years old. And uh, every four years or so, we end up having to defend it. But my advice is use it while it's here and uh, take advantage of what we, we have and, and what we know. But uh, there's no sense in worrying about something that might happen. We, we'd sort of be locked down, wouldn't be able to accomplish anything if we worried about all the things that could happen. So without further ado, we're going to jump in here right now. Once again, my name's David Moore, and uh, I've got an hour's worth of material. Here we go. So, as I said, 1031's been around since 1921, so we're out 100 years now. It's, it's not something that's new in any way. And, you know, up until tax reform in 2017, it applied to personal property also. So we used to do a lot of high-end cars, artwork, businesses even. And uh, in, in 2017, we lost out on the personal property aspects of 1031. I think the, the government gave us the... Uh, Opportunity zone as as an option, and you know the opportunity zone is a development play, and it, it's there. It's got limited tax deferral into that thing, and then you've got uh, pretty much tax free if you do it correctly. You follow all the rules going forward, but it, understand it is a, is a development issue, and and it's something that you've got to look at the quality of that project period before you jump into it. But 1031, as it stands today, applies to real property. So everyone on this call, every broker out there, the stuff you're selling. Uh, we used to say about uh, 60 some, 64 uh, percent, I think, was the number of the property on the market could or should be exchanged. You're thinking, well, gee, what does it apply to? 1031 is going to apply to any any real property that's been held for investment or or that was acquired with the intent to hold for investment. So what doesn't fit within that? Well, a primary residence. But I'll throw this at at you. What happens if your gains? Think about think about Section 121, the universe exclusion. It came into play in 1997. In 1997, the 250 and 500 meant something. Today, the 250 or 500 does not do a whole lot. Um, I just got a message that the slide show is not uh, coming up. Let me see if it does now. Hopefully it will. I'll get a message in a second. We're on, uh, on the second slide, so you haven't missed anything yet. And it's talking about uh, 1031 and, and the dates it, it was effective. So hopefully you've got it now there. I apologize if you didn't see it. But, you know, as far as 1031, it's been around since the, the 20, since 1921, like I said. So it's, it's a long, long time. It was originally put in play for actually ag land, stuff like that. But uh, anyway, I got a message. It's all up and good. So we look at it. And in any real property held for investment is going to be like kind with any real property held for investment. As I said, in Section 121, the 250 or 500 meant something when it, when it came in in 1997. Today, we've got lots of situations where somebody's primary residence has gains well in excess of those numbers. As a result, we end up having a situation where we convert lots of primary residences into investment property. And so once again, we're going to come back to that seasoning period again. You know, how long is long enough? What's going on with that? So uh, think of what it is when you first have that, that listing appointment with somebody. Think about what that property is when you're walking through it. Does it appear to be a residence? Does, does it appear to be investment? Is it both? What, what do I mean by both? Well, an obvious uh, example would be a duplex half owner occupied, but maybe a less obvious example would be a, you know, a farm with a farmhouse and the working land. You're going to have a farmhouse go section 121, the working land 1031. 
any of you working out of your home. Now, I would put it out there in this last year, and I've seen actually proposals in Europe where they want to tax people for working out of their homes because the last the lost revenue of all the transportation, everything going to and from, and the you know the governments see that they're losing money. So, you know, understand that United States right now, they're not looking at that type of thing. Some places in Europe they are, but with respect to if you treat your home as a home office, if you take that 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 portion of that home and treat it as a home office, what are you doing? You're taking depreciation on it. Well, for every up, there's a down. So understand that if you've started doing that and you treat that portion of your home as a home office for more than you know three out of the last five years, when you sell your home, that portion of the home that was a home office has to be 1031 exchanged, or you're gonna pay tax on that portion of it. So that's one of the like, less obvious situations that come up all the time. And it's just an example that you gotta be careful. And I always put it out there. It's like, when you go out to a listing appointment, what does it appear to be? And what do you really want it to be? What, what is that person going to do? And think about it. Every dollar you save somebody means you got three or $4 more to invest with the loan to values at you know, 70, 75%, 80%. It makes a big difference. So every dollar you save somebody, you've got that much more to reinvest. Think about the taxpayer that you talked about this situation when you go to list the property versus the one that found out after they sold the property they could have done this. Even in today's world, after a hundred years, there's many people that call us the day after closing. This thing has to be set up pre-settlement. So, you know, people ask all the time when we want you to think about an exchange. I'm going to say when you list the property, it, the last the last time you want to be thinking about it is is when when you've got an escrow opened and the things are pending because think about this if, if you've suggested this option for a taxpayer you've got a seller and you've got a buyer there's an old saying out there buyers are liars but in a 1031 there's lots of people out there that will tell you that prices have gone up artificially uh, above what might be normal because of 1031 because you've got a situation where you've got hard timelines that have to be met. So if you've got a buyer, I'll just put it out to you, you've got a buyer that's walking off the street to make an offer on a property that you've got listed, you know, what's the motivation, what's the hard timelines, what are they looking at versus some somebody in an exchange that if you as a listing broker can find out what they've ID'd, where they are in the 45 and 180 day timelines, you've got a lot more leverage to get things done, get your clients taken care of. Now. That comment about getting your clients taken care of flipped back on the other side. Now you're working as a buyer's broker. Do you want anybody to know what's been identified and where you are in the 45 and 180 days? I'm going to tell you as a buyer's broker, you need to keep your you know, cards close to your chest. Don't let that information out because if you're sitting there bickering over $10,000 and the seller knows that that property is the only one ID'd, and you're outside the 45 days, 10 grand means nothing because you, you, you're gladly gonna give up the 10 to save tax of 100. So understand who you're representing. If you're representing both sides, be very careful with those timelines. But that 45 day timeline is the toughest thing with any exchange. The best way to address that is if you've got a listing, let's say I come to you and I want you to list the property for me. So you list it today, this Friday, somebody comes in with cash, they wanna close it next Tuesday. Well, your first thought, my first thought might be great. That was easy. But now I'm in a situation where I've only got 45 days from settlement to ID what I want to buy. Now I've got that clock ticking and that's not a good situation. What I'm going to tell you is you get that offer. If you don't know where you're going, you're where your client's going. Ask for whatever time you feel you need to get that taken care of. Take care of the people you're, you're representing. One last comment, the, the last uh, paragraph or sentence on this page talks about, we can exchange anywhere in the United States. So it's domestic property for domestic property, foreign for foreign, but we can't go domestic to foreign or foreign to domestic. So if you're talking about somebody selling a property in the United States, we can get them anything in the United States. We cannot buy them something in Italy, for example, or Mexico. So what's gain? Why are we even talking about this? Gain's just simply the difference between the, the basis and the adjusted sales price. Basis has absolutely nothing to do with profit. So when we look at a basis in a property, it's the purchase price plus capital improvements minus depreciation. Now understand that pre-2020, 
pre-1997, uh, we had Section 1034, the old residential rollover. So when you sold your home, you had two years to buy a new home of equal or greater value. And if you did so, you were going to be totally tax deferred. Well, that went away from the 250 and 500. And now you've got straight exclusions. You can do that once every two years. But when we're looking at, at that gain, uh, it really makes a difference. That purchase price, typically I have an asterisk on here because the purchase price, that initial number in the calculations for basis can change depending on, let's say if you sold a home pre-97 and you bought a new home, well, you had a basis carry forward. Section 1031 is a basis carry forward. The gain does not go away, it's tax deferral. Uh, section 1033, involuntary conversion, same situation. Let's say you had a client with property on that east side light rail, and they came in and wanted to put the light rail in so they condemned the property. Well, that's a tax deferral situation. You've got deferred gain, a basis carry forward. But you know all those things, are looking at it, it's going to impact the purchase price. If I gave you a property, your basis in that property would be what my basis was. If you inherited a property from me, you got a stepped up basis to current market value, at least in today's world. So that first number, even though it appears, hey, gee, it's a purchase price. Well, I always ask people, did you pull money out of your pocket to buy the property or where'd that money come from for that purchase? Because that's going to impact that initial number to calculate the basis. Then we've got improvements. And I do this all day, every day. I ask you, okay, during the time you've owned this property, did you do any capital improvements? I'm sure you put money into it, what'd you do? Oh yeah, I did all this work. I did you know, $100,000 in capital improvements over the last years. I said, okay, did you write it off? Oh yeah, I wrote it all off. Well, you expensed it, does nothing for your basis. See, either capitalize or expense, or you capitalize increases the basis, expensing does not. So we have to understand those quote unquote improvements depending on their classified, may or may not impact the basis of the property. Then depreciation. Well, understand that the government's position on depreciation is you should have taken it, therefore you did. So I've had many conversations over the 30 years I've been doing this, talking to people and they say, well, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to depreciate it. Well, so you might be in a situation where if by law you were, you were supposed to take depreciation, you didn't take it, now you, you might be taxed as though you took it without having the benefit of taking it. So let, let me put this out to everybody out here right now. We're just one person on this successful team of professionals you're gonna handle and work with during the investment life of you and your clients. Who else is on that team? Obviously, good brokers. You guys are there, tax and legal people. I want you to pay tax and legal people for an opinion. I don't want you to pay them to learn. So it's important you're working with people that know this stuff, and if you've got questions, we're probably going to you know, answer the questions, arm you with information to go talk to your tax and legal people. And you know, if we're in a gray area and you can either justify what's being done or if they don't like it, you're not going to do it. So, so those tax people are very important, but finance people, property managers. I think property management, if you've got property in Multnomah County these days, understand those tenants are very well educated. And a lot of the mom and pop operators of income properties right now are having a hard time staying on top of those laws. So I think property management is one of those things that's going to get more and more important just as a tool to limit your liability on things. But so the base is a purchase price plus capital improvements minus depreciation. So your gain is simply that number subtracted from the adjusted sales price. So the adjusted sales price would be the gross net of closing costs, you know, the broker's commissions, title escrow fees, tax and legal fees, the current prorated property taxes. Whatever that number is, that's the number the base is going to be sub subtracted from to trigger, you know, the, the uh, tax consequence of gain. Also, it's going to tell us what we need. That adjusted sales price is what needs to be spent on the replacement property. Now, understand I said nothing about debt. Debt has no impact on, on the basis or on gain. Debt is just going to be you know, paid out and, and you're going to go out and on the, on the acquisition side, you're gonna hear, you probably heard people say through the years, we have to replace debt in an exchange. We're gonna talk on a page called the napkin test. That is not true, okay? Debt can go away two ways, one by going down in value, the other way debt goes away is by adding cash, which is always fine. One last statement I want to make on this slide, though, it's really important. We've, we've had, you know, after the initial impact of COVID last spring, we probably lost 40% of the business for maybe two months. And, and then since then, 
we've had a just a gangbuster year. So the volume, the transaction volume has been very, very high. Now it's high for a variety of reasons. You know, one, people are wanting to diversify. Wall Street's done great. And they want to diversify, get in tangible assets. You hear, we all hear the ads for gold and silver on, on TV and all they're selling is tangible asset, which is what real estate is. But real estate, unlike those assets, does not have to go up to make people money, right? You've got tenants paying it down, you got interest deductions, depreciation, all these other things working. So real estate's just, I mean, I, I believe the ultimate tangible asset. But you know, let's say we have an adjustment, things start locking up, let's say financing gets tighter, now we have an erosion of values. Understand, and, and maybe you've got clients that have tenants that have been paying and they're gonna lose a property, for example. Well, for those of you that were in the business during the last crash, you dealt, you probably all ended up short sale experts, but you got to understand short sales or foreclosures, okay? You've got relief on a primary residence, you do not on investment properties. So phantom gain is a situation where you could lose a property foreclosure and actually have tax consequences. And you're going, well, how can that be? I lost everything. Well, in a foreclosure, the government's going to treat that debt as the sales price. In a short sale, the same situation. The debt, if the debt exceeds the sales price, the debt is the sales price. So in a, in a foreclosure, that debt, if the debt exceeds the basis, you've got gain. That's called phantom gain. And you could have a situation where you lose the property, lose everything, and you still have tax exposure. And that's why this slide's in there. Understand when you're talking to people what is possible out there and make them aware even if a thing goes if an asset goes down in value even if they're upside down and it, it it's really doesn't matter they could have a situation where they have tax consequences and that is why i say tax people are probably one of the most important people in investors in a real estate investor's life because they're going to be looking at these situations and and use those people use those professionals don't use them april 14th Talk to them before you sell things. Understand what to, what tax liability might be uh, realized in a disposition, even in a situation where you think there might not be. So you pay the tax. What kind of tax consequence are you looking at? Uh, this is something that understand. A lot of times people think back to my comment on 1031 with the exclusion for people making more than 400k. If that were to happen. People don't understand whatever they sell, whatever that gain is on that disposition is going to be put on top of what they make in a given tax year. So typically, we're always going to be looking at a federal rate of 20% on appreciation, 25% on depreciation recapture. Uh, if you are living in Oregon, which all of us today are, uh, and I do these presentations coast to coast, so some states it looks a lot different. Washington looks a lot different than here, but we're talking about 9 to 12% right now in Oregon. And there's talk, Multnomah County actually going up, the top effective tax rate in the state of Oregon could hit 15% if they pass everything they're looking to pass right now. So when you look at selling something, you've got the state tax of 20 to 20, or the federal of 20 to 25, state nine to 12, and the healthcare tax is still there. I don't know, you know when, if it ever goes away, another 3.8 on top, if you're gonna hit with that. So you figure you're gonna lose no less than you know a third of that gain to taxes so as i said earlier 1031 is an elective thing you choose to do it or not do it and and it's up to you to decide whether you want to pay that tax on disposition or you want to keep your equity for you know going forward intact and that's a big big question now imagine a situation where you hold, held a property and these rates are actually uh, long-term capital gains tax rates okay we're not talking about uh, short-term gains tax rates, and that's something else they're talking about doing is treating all capital gains as uh, normal income tax. So understand long-term capital gains tax rates are substantially different than normal income tax rates. So if you've held a property for under a year, all those people that flip properties, and you know, I laugh because that was my background, and we hear, you know, this, uh, I don't, the people have these acronyms for all these things. I think one is BRRRR, buy, repair, renew, refi, repeat. Well, I'm, I, you know, the way I was taught, we didn't, we didn't just do that. We held the property for another year or two after that refi, then we do an exchange out of it. And, and the money you're getting via the refi money is typically gonna be probably in excess 
of what you'd net after paying the taxes. So anybody that just flips properties and pays tax, normal income tax on disposition every time, you're probably gonna get tired of that over a period of time. So understand one, that there's no required hold. It has to do with what you're doing with the asset during the time you own it. If you're a dealer, it's not gonna qualify, but you can have a dealer, that's not a, not a, a totally correct statement. You could be a dealer and have property that qualifies for 1031, and you've obviously got property that does not. If all you do is buy an asset, uh, build it up, prepare it for sale, and immediately upon completion improvements, put it back on the market, you did not hold that property for investment. Now, if you've got other circumstances that are triggering this thing, it's possible even for somebody as a dealer to do 1031s with their investment property, they're gonna have two pools of property, the resale property and the investment pool. So don't think, well, gee, I'm a broker, I'm a real estate developer, I can't do an exchange. That doesn't mean nothing you have can qualify, it just means we have to look at it and better understand what you did with the property during the time you owned it. All right, that's what's important. But but if you've held it for under a year, if you sell, you're going to pay normal income tax. Whatever you make on that's thrown on top, and and you puts in you whatever tax tax bracket it puts you into. Uh, I will put it out there once again. There's no state of required hold in 1031. So even though it was held for under a year, depending on what you did with it during that time, it could be possible to do an exchange on that property. So the bold at the bottom, why volunteer to pay a tax that you don't have to? So we sort of say this is a points-free, interest-free loan from the federal government for as long as you choose to take it. And I would say, once again, use it while it's here. This slide, for up to me, every time you go on a listing appointment, you go out, throw this in front of the people and say, okay, what is this thing that we're listing? What, what is it that we're going to sell, relinquish? And what do we really want to buy? A primary residence? Uh, section 121, 1031 applies to virtually everything else with the exceptions of property held for resale or section 1033, the involuntary conversion. But 121 just says you have to live in the property for an aggregate of two out of the preceding five years. So you might go out on the listing appointment and it appears to be investment property. I'm gonna say, ask that person, well, has it been an investment property? Always been an investment property? If they're young, maybe it was their first home, they moved out of it. Maybe they had a kid that's too small or they wanted something else. So the question is, you know, how long have they been out of that property? And if you take a listing and they've been out of it for, you know, let's say, you know, two years and nine months, well, I'm going to tell you, you got three months to get that thing out of there if they still want to take the exclusion. Even if they were looking at 1031, why not take the exclusion on it if you've got that opportunity? So once again, Section 121's primary residence, occupy it as such for two out of the preceding five years. You can do that once every two years. But if you read the fine print, you can have multiple sales as part of one action. What do I mean by that? You could have a house, the adjacent piece of property. Nine times out of 10 in today's world, we're slicing off that adjacent uh, property and we're going to use 1031 to get rid of that. But maybe if you had a smaller property, smaller gains, you could take and split off that property, sell it and sell the home. And as long as both sales still fit within the uh, section 121 limits, the guidelines, then you're gonna be able to use section 121. And I would say, why not do that? Especially in a market like today where, hey, you know, you might, uh, might not wanna find something today that looks good, but uh, maybe you want the money next year or you've got patient money versus time money it makes a big difference once again, 1031, as I said, it's going to apply to virtually everything other than the primary residence, but we can have a primary residence, we convert it into investment, we can take an investment, convert it into a primary residence. So you sort of look at this thing, you say, okay, what's it appear to be and what do I really want it to be? How am I going to keep my clients' money theirs and then get them into what they want? So the timing's critical, understanding what they need to spend when you're first talking to them is important, and you're going to be looking at those timelines. Don't get in that time crunch. Seasoning, how long is long enough? I hear people talk about it all the time. Well, it says two years in the code. It does not say two years in the code. It says two years if you're exchanging with a related party. So lineal ascendants, descendants, their spouses, or any legal entity owned and controlling interest by one of those, those would be a related party transaction. And in that situation, you know, it appears it's a hard, bold, black and white you have to hold the property for two years well even in a related party transaction if you read the fine print there you can see that it states that unless there was no intent to avoid tax so deferral is one thing avoidance is another 
Uh, so, you know, even with a related party transaction, it's not an absolute two year hold. But uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I'd like to see things held for a year. And that's based on two factors. One, the break between short and long term tax rates that falls at one year. The second reason I say a year is because it's been proposed a couple of times. So I figure, hey, if, if we've got taxes that change at that one year period and they've proposed it, I think that's what they'd like to see. Uh, different tax years certainly looks better than the same year. But this slide talks about a court case. The recent case was a four month hold. Now these people gave up an investment property, went out and exchanged into a new quote unquote investment property. They get audited because what happened is they ended up moving into that property after four months. They got audited, they got taken to court and they prevailed in court after a four month hold citing their intent. Now what they argued was they, they had documented listings, documented the showings and they basically ended up in a situation where they said they could not get it rented, they could not afford to hold the new property and their primary residence, so they decided to get rid of the primary residence, move into, their, into that investment property. I think that this is a very uh, trying case. I think that four months is very aggressive. In this set of circumstances, I have more of a problem with a four month hold here than I do with somebody with a month, one month hold on an unsolicited offer. Now, what I mean by that is you could have sold a property to somebody and a month after they've closed on it, their next door neighbor, somebody comes up unsolicited, gives them an offer that's too good to pass up. I'm saying that it's possible they could take that offer and move forward again. But you don't want to get too lucky too often. You don't want to establish patterns. You don't want it to look like, you know, the old state statement with pigs and hogs, right? Don't be that hog. You're going to get slaughtered. So arms length transactions, uh, in the longer, the better. One year, I think, is, is justifiable and safe. Under that, you just need to be able to prepare, you know, be prepared to defend it. And who is the most important person in your life at that situation at that point? Your tax people need to agree with what's going on. If they've got questions on holding periods, we're happy to provide any guidance we've got. Uh, we're gonna do what we can to help you out. So this slide just talks about COVID. So imagine you've got, like I said at the very beginning, you've got a situation where somebody bought the property and now their tenants aren't holding it or aren't paying, they can't afford to hold. Is it possible for them to give it up? And I'm gonna tell you, yes, it is. And you know that last slide talked about it. This is just further substantiating it. By the way, this presentation will be sent out with your CE time too. And if you've got a situation, uh, it will be recorded and up online. So if you've got clients that you wanna have watch something, they're free to do that. They can just log into our YouTube channels, Equity Advantage 1031 or IRA Advantage Self-Directed IRAs. And there's a whole library of uh, videos on topics everything from this stuff to actually life uh, life settlements believe it or not but uh we've got them on delaware statutory trust which are very popular right now uh deferred actually not anything on deferred sales trust uh, charitable remainder trust all these different things we've provided information on but uh, and, and if you've got a, a question on something you'd like to see us put something together, please don't hesitate to reach out to Celia. She does takes care of our in-house filming on different things. So she can uh, sort of task me with presenting what you're interested in. So what qualifies for 1031? Dealer property, we sort of talked about that. Depends what you're doing with it. If all you do is buy it, fix it, turn it, that's held for resale, it's not gonna qualify. If you buy it, fix it, rent it out for a period of time, then it could. Flipping properties, you know, once again, we're looking at dealer property, flipping property, primary residence, maybe, right? Maybe the gains are in excess, so you wanna convert it to such. Maybe you've got a portion of your primary residence that qualifies for 1031. So we're gonna look at that situation, what's happening, what's available, what, what is gonna fit that person's situation best between 121, 1031, 1033, or a combination thereof. Personal property, we no longer have the ability to do exchange the personal property. Partnership interests are specifically prohibited from, uh, from exchange, uh, 1031 exchange treatment. So uh, a partnership in and of itself can do the exchange, but the members of that partnership cannot go different directions. So if we had a, a uh, our, our advanced classes, we talked about partnership exchanges, but think of it this way, you may have heard the, the term a drop and swap or a swap and drop. 
And, and as I said, if we've got a limited liability company, that's a partnership if it contains multiple members. Even a husband and wife in the state of Oregon are not treated as a single member. So for example, husbands and wives can go out of a limited liability company in and out of them during an exchange in California or Washington, but in Oregon, we cannot since we're not a community property state. So even a husband and a wife, and you might, you might have had the situation uh, yourself. And I've had many presentations where somebody says, well, you can't, you can't finance a limited liability company. So think about the, the client of yours. They, they start off with a rental house and they get a second one, then they get a third one, then they get a fourth one. Then their lawyer says, you know what? You've got all this liability out there. You know, let's limit it by using a limited liability company. So you shove all your properties in that limited liability company. If we're looking at four units or less, what are they typically financed at? residential type of transaction. Will Freddie or Fannie finance that LLC? And the answer is typically no. So what happens is we do the exchange, even for that husband and wife in Oregon, they give up the property in the limited liability company, they go to finance a new property, and now the cost of money is greater and they want to take it personally, they cannot do that. So we need to break that in any predisposition even if it's a husband and wife, and we need to do that and do it at a period of time where we're comfortable defending that change in ownership. Now, let's say that I own something with a couple of you out there. Let's say five of us own a property, and uh, we have this property owned in a limited liability company. We go to sell that property. Well, we as a group can go forward, but what happens if one of us wants to go away? Okay, I'm going to deed that person out, Tennessee in common. You're going to amend the purchase sale agreement to read it's no longer between the buyer and the LLC, but it's between the buyer, the LLC, and that person wanting out, Tennessee in common. So we've successfully gotten them out. They're going to pay the tax, or if they want to do an exchange, they're going to have to defend a real short hold period there potentially. And uh, you know that's a classic drop and swap. Now, what happens if all of us want to go direct, different directions? Well, then we're going to break that entity entirely. Everybody's going to be deeded out, Tennessee in common. You're going to draw that purchase sale agreement. You know, it's going to be assigned from that entity to all of us, Tennessee in common. Then we're all free to go our different directions. But you know, once again, I want to stress that there is some vulnerability there because we personally did not hold the property for investment predisposition. Uh, at least that's the argument the IRS is going to have. So we just have those conversations day in, day out. The second biggest headache we've got with any exchange is that vesting component. The biggest issue is always going to be time. Partnership interest, we talk vacation homes. We can buy a property. We can't just vacation homes, second homes, for example, you have a different set of rules for. Uh, but if we're talking about an investment property being exchanged into a vacation home, I'm going to tell you, limit your personal use to no more than two weeks in the first year. You're working on the thing. After that, you can move into it if you want it. But we, we need to defend what we're doing. We need to hold the replacement property for a period of time, seasoning it as an investment property. I like simple, all right? KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. If I look at retirement accounts, I got two issues that I look at. What's the person want to buy? Who are they transacting between or for the benefit of? 1031 is a little busier. We've got four issues. One, it's got to be an exchange. You're going to you're gonna list and sell something as you normally would. We're going to step in when the deal gets to escrow, draw an assignment agreement, allowing us to assume all rights and obligations, the taxpayer as a seller, and uh, ultimately as the buyer of the replacement property. But you can negotiate the sale pre-hour involvement. You can negotiate a purchase pre-hour involvement. Just include some provision in 1031 or in the purchase sale agreement establishing the intent to do an exchange. Now, your state forms include boilerplate that allows the buyer or seller to do an exchange, but it doesn't tell anybody that they are. So how is escrow, if you've got on the sales side, I think it's important to put something in there stating that, you know, that the uh, your client, the seller is gonna do an exchange at no additional you know, cost or liability to the buyer, whatever you wanna put in there. But let people know so the thing does not get closed without it being structured. If, if it closes, you know, even if, if it's the next day, if the taxpayer's got actual or constructive receipt, the ability to touch the money, they've got tax exposure. So we need to get, get it taken care of pre-settlement, all right? But once it's an exchange, they give us something, we've got to give them something back. The exchange is between the taxpayer and the exchange company, not the buyer and seller. So they give us something, we've got to give them something back. Two, the items relinquished and received must be of like kind. Three, we've got to go for total deferral across or up in value and equity. And then finally, we've got to have continuity vesting. And that was, uh, that was what we're looking at with that uh, partnership comment a few minutes ago. 
So the exchange could be a delayed exchange, which is a typical transaction today. You sell first, buy it later. You've got 45 days from that settlement date to ID what's to be acquired, 180 days to get it done. A reverse exchange means we're buying first, selling later. You're gonna have 45 days from the date of acquisition uh, to ID what's to be sold, 180 days to relinquish it. An improvement exchange means we're going to buy and build something and then convey the improved property to our taxpayer. We can't buy something, give it to them, and then do the improvements. It's all got to be done prior to their receipt. Warehousing is anytime we take ownership of something. So a warehouse transaction could be a reverse exchange because we're going to be an owner. The taxpayer can't own the new and old property at the same time. So we create an LLC in the exchange world. It's called an EAT, an exchange combination title holder. It takes ownership of the new or old property, depending on what structure we're using. An improvement exchange means that EAT is going to take ownership of the property, build it out, and then convey the improved property to the taxpayer. Warehousing, you could have a property that you're taking as partial consideration for a sale, and you don't want that property. So what happened in that situation is the seller uh, receives, if you look at your purchase sale agreement, it says total consideration, doesn't say total cash. So you, your consideration would be anything. But let's say it's a, a property they don't want, or maybe you took a boat as partial consideration. Well, that boat's not of like kind, neither is cash really for that matter. But all we do is convert non-like kind assets into like kind assets. So we would take the property, get rid of it, and then convert it to cash. Then we've got the cash to go forward. Or we use that asset to go buy something. It doesn't really matter. But you, you're just looking at this structure. It could be a swap, it could be a delayed exchange, a swap, a true swap. You've got something, I've got something. Each of us, it's mutual. we each want what the other has. And there's same value and equity. A swap agreement can take care of that transaction. But typically, you're looking at delayed. We're doing a lot of reverse and improvement exchanges these days. But warehousing is anytime we're doing a, a, an improvement exchange, reverse exchange, we're receiving something that the taxpayer does not want. Like kind refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. Any real property held for investments, like kind with any real property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. I have people all the time say, well, hey, I remember when it used to be house for house, land for land. It's never been that way. So you can exchange out of that dirt into an apartment complex, into a place at the beach, into a strip mall. Any real property held for investment is going to be like kind with any real property acquired with the intent to hold for investment. Now, at that 10 o'clock position, I'm going to point something out. It says build a suit, but you know, really what we're talking about, uh, about there is a 30-year lease. We're doing a lot of transactions. Think about how long, if anyone's tried to build something in the state of Oregon lately, how long does it take you to get a shovel into the ground, right? I mean, Obama administration used to talk about shovel ready. And, and if we look at shovel ready in the state of Oregon, how long does it take you to get something shovel ready? So to get an improvement exchange done in this state is entirely different than doing it in Texas, for example. They want us to build stuff there. Here they do everything they can to prevent us from, tax, you know, from building, it seems like. But uh, 180 days goes very, very quickly if we're going to build something. So we're doing a lot of uh, leasehold improvement exchanges meaning what we'll do is you've got a property you don't want you've got a property you'd like to build on we'll take the proceeds from that property that you no longer wanted go vertical on the property you do want to improve and that 30-year leasehold interest constitutes ownership of real property so that llc we put together take enters into a 30-year lease with you for the property to be improved we go vertical build it out and convey the leasehold improvements which are legally defined as real property at that length and uh, convey those leasehold improvements back completing the transaction. So that's just uh, you know, a quick overview of how we can actually take proceeds to build on something you already own. The napkin test tells us what we have to do to be totally tax deferred. And it, and it really just says you need to go across or up in value and equity. At the very beginning, I talked about uh, the, the misunderstanding out there. People are always saying you got to replace debt in exchange. And what happens in a recessionary period? Typically, you've got a reduction in value, which ends up a, a corresponding reduction in equity. And then you're going to have a tightening of the loan. So you're going to have a reduced loan to value. And when we go into recessionary periods, people are always asking, well, gee, should I pay off the property if I don't want debt on the replacement? Or if I want less debt on the replacement? The answer is no, you don't have to do that. So you can, you can offset a reduction in mortgage two ways, or where you can offset the reduction in mortgage with cash. So you can, you can take care of, you can always add cash to the transaction, you know, offsetting the reduction mortgage. You just can't go down in value because that's going to trigger tax because you went down in value. Boots, anything received that's not of like kind. 
Continuity of vesting, as I said earlier about the partnership issues, this just means that the taxpayer that relinquishes has to receive. And you'd think it would be a lot easier thing to accomplish than it is. And understand that the tax and legal worlds don't see eye to eye with the finance world. And who makes the rules? Those with the gold, right? So we're in, a, in this predicament a lot of times where you've got a lender that's saying you have to do this. And we've got the tax laws that say you have to do this. So we're sort of looking you know, back and forth on how we get the transaction done. This is why we want to know about the transaction. Ideally, when you go to list a property, we can look at how it's owned and sort of troubleshoot and hopefully uh, eliminate any of these headaches that come up after the fact if we've got more time to deal with. Timelines the 45 and 180 days, both at settlement, as I said. Uh, there is There had never been an extension pre-9-11. Since then, every time we've got a presidentially declared national disaster, we've had extensions uh, issued. We had COVID extensions last year. They expired in July, but uh, we have heard nothing about any other taxpayer relief with extensions of 1031. Obviously, if they come out, we're going to get that word out immediately. Property identification. I'm going to go through this real quick. I've got 13 minutes roughly left. I got to get, get through some examples. But a lot of times people think, well, you can only ID three properties. Well, that's not true. You can ID any number of properties. It just gets more complicated with uh, the the increased numbers. So if you keep it to three or fewer, it's very easy. So you, you you've got three ID options. Each works independently. The others, the first option just says you can ID up to three properties of any value. Second one says you can ID more than three properties. The total value of the properties can't exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. Third choice, you can exceed three, you can exceed 200%, but you've got to close 95% of the aggregate value of all properties ID. Well, that's closing virtually everything. So my advice is get the deal done inside the 45 days. That way you don't have any issues. Now, I want to point out that this slide, when can I get my money, is probably more important than a lot of things these days. Because if you enter this exchange, what I'm going to tell you is you cannot receive funds out of the transaction until you've acquired everything you have the right to buy. So let's say that we set up the exchange. The relinquished property closes. Now we're inside the 45 days. And let's say you're, you're 25 days into it. And you're just saying, the heck with it. I don't want to complete the transaction. I just want my money out. Well, we cannot legally give you your money until after midnight, the 45th day. So there's something called the 1031 G6 rules. Uh, and they state that a taxpayer cannot receive the funds until they've received all property they have the right to buy. So that would be at no time prior to midnight, the 45th day, after the 45th day, only after the taxpayers received everything they have the right to buy. So uh, I mentioned opportunity zones at the top, and I'm sure everybody on this call has, has seen or heard things on opportunity zones. If you haven't, once again, take a look Take a look at our YouTube channel. There's a, a real estate lawyer, Connie Rathbone, that's done a lot of work in that space. There's a whole series of uh, uh, issues covered in, in our presentations on that, the webinars that have been uh, posted on that, that topic. But one of the things that OZ contains is a 180 day time period. It is not a fallback for a failed exchange. If you wanna go into an opportunity zone, you've gotta terminate the exchange to get access to the money. So as I said, 1031 G6 says you can only get money out of the transaction after you've acquired all property you have the right to buy. If you're working with somebody and they're banging up against that 45th day, you need to instill that that is a critical decision. At that 45th day, the taxpayer is totally committed to completing the exchange or they should sink it, okay? So even if they've turned an ID in, they can rescind the ID prior to midnight the 45th day. After the 45th day, they cannot rescind the ID. So if they're thinking about going into an opportunity zone, they need to terminate the transaction at that point. Now, if it's just a limited, uh, limited amount of money going to the OZ, then at that situation, our ID forms, what we've done to uh, allow this is, is the taxpayer can only get money out at closing or after they've acquired all property they have the right to buy. Our ID form includes blanks. 
The first one is just three, taking care of the three property rule. Second one is, you know, over the three. So we've got more lines there. But what you're doing on our form is you're IDing whatever number of properties, but you can fill in, there's a paragraph that just asks how many or states that you only have the right to buy X. So you could ID 10 properties and say, oh, I have the right to buy two. As soon as you've closed those two, we're outside the 45 days, you don't have the right to buy anything more, you can get access to that money. Now, and this is really why it's so critical that, that they're either in or out at that 45th day. So imagine if, if uh, you found them a couple of properties to ID on day 45, they fill out the identification and day 60, you find them the perfect property. Maybe the two that they did identify turned out where you know they didn't want them or maybe they sold, they can't get them anymore. Well, you can't just add properties there and they still would have the right to buy those properties from somebody else. So you can't just say, well, hey, you know, I, I give me my money, They'll, those all sold. Uh, it's not an elective deal there. You've got to make sure that you've got, now if there was an extreme material defect, you can get access to the money. But imagine you find that other property, we can't just give them the money. So that 45 days is really critical. Day 45, they're totally committed to completing the transaction, whatever they're identifying, or they should terminate the transaction. That way on day, uh, on, we can then refund the balance of the proceeds on day 46 and they're fine. Current trends, you know, it, it's going to come back to what you know. Uh, you know, we, we have a situation late in the year where, and, and this 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 first bullet's not a current. I put this together before the year end. So you know, that first bullet was taking receipt of property. When you're going to have actual co constructive receipt of those funds, as far as tax liability, so on and so forth. But uh, so anytime you've got a trans, and you might be working with some of the closed deal last year, if they've got a 45 that the clock's currently ticking on, they need to complete the exchange prior to filing tax return. If they file a return pre dis, uh, pre uh, pre completion of the exchange, they then terminated the transaction accidentally. That's not a good thing. So anytime we're looking late year transactions. If you're looking at a 45 or one in the 180 beyond April 15th, if they're banging up against that, they need to file an extension to allow them to complete the transaction prior to filing a return. But we've got lots of people that might be in a partial exchange these days. You can, like I said, get money out at settlement. Uh, every dollar you spend, 1031 is not all or nothing. So every dollar spent over your basis represents tax for a game. So we've got people that might be doing partial exchanges. We've got people that are just buying 45 days to see what's out there. They've got transactions that might not work. We've got some failed transactions. People are just, you know, properties moving fast, moving on up, moving down, DSTs and ticks, passive investments. A lot of people are disenchanted with owning rental properties these days just because of tenant rights. So Delaware Statutory Trust or Tennessee in Common, these are institutionally structured investments that satisfy 1031. Combinations of IRAs and 1031s, got people who want to combine qualified money with 1031 money, and you can do that. It's got to be, if we're using a combination of 1031 and, and IRA 401k funds, it's got to be a tenancy in common acquisition. If you're just going to go out and buy something, uh, it's a prohibited transaction to transact between or for the benefit of disqualified party with, with IRA 401k funds, but it's not to transact along with them. Few examples. This this is uh, well. This slide. I, I I apologize. We have an extent. So understand there there's still with COVID and the CARES Act. We've got some things where you've got access to money with the retirement accounts that you normally would not have. So typically, you know, typically somebody with an IRA or 401k, you can do a 60 day rollover once a year. Uh, you, what that means is you could pull money out and as long as you get it back into a plan within 60 days, you, you'd be okay. And we've got some refinement in those things that's available. We had some straight up opportunities with those things. A lot of them have gone away, but when you look at access to funds, typically a 401k, for example, if you came to me with a retirement account, you wanted me to put a retirement account for you as a real estate broker. If you don't have any employees, I'm, I'm going to do a solo 401k for you. If you've got full-time employees or employee period, I'm probably going to do a checkbook IRA for you. Depends what type of accounts going on there, but but we can we can have joint ownership between you and a retirement account, but we can't sell to, buy from, loan to, borrow from. And 401k plans, you've got the ability to borrow half what's in it to a max of 50,000. That number's up to 100 right now, I believe, for a period of time. So 
you know, in those situations, we can use a retirement account sort of as gap finance, or we can use retirement accounts during the 60 day rollover to fund the acquisition or reverse exchange if it needs to happen. So this is an example of phantom gain, and this is an this is a deal that we did last uh, last crash, and and this is a person that had some land. The bank actually failed. He was behind. He was he came to us. He wanted to use his dad's funds to uh, finance a, a a payoff of the property so they wouldn't lose it. The bank was going to go away. The bank went away. The loan was going to go away. The guy was going to lose the asset. So. It would be a prohibited transaction to have, just use dad's money to pay off a property junior own. But what we did is we created checkbook IRA for dad. We created a second limited liability company. Junior put the property into that limited liability company. Dad's retirement account put money into that limited liability company at the same time. Now the property is owned by the limited liability company with, with dad's IRA and junior as members. And it had the money to pay the property off. Since then, they went vertical, built out a, a multifamily project. And, you know, one, we saved the property. Two, it allowed them to, you know, keep forward and, and keep things intact and ultimately get where they wanted to go. Gave Dad's retirement account a great investment, saved, saved Junior's tail. Partial exchanges. These people sold a, a sold a property, a, a three million dollar apartment uh, complex. All they wanted was replacement property, a million dollars. The napkin test, as I said earlier, says you go across or up in value and equity, and uh, for total deferral. But if somebody's basis in a property, was, let's say, was five hundred thousand, and they spent six hundred on a replacement, they're deferring gain on hundred. Now, in this situation, they went from a $3 million to a $1 million property. So they have tax exposure on $2 million. Uh, but that's what they wanted. Buy these people what they want. Buy your clients what they want. So in this situation, their tax basis was $250,000. The perfect replacement property was a $1 million. They deferred the difference between the two fifty dollars and the million, uh, which you know triggered tax exposure on on uh, the two million, but deferred the tax on 750, still saved them a quarter million in tax. So, you know, why pay tax if you don't have to? Even in this situation, it might've appeared at first glance, well, why would you do that? Well, that's what they wanted. Maybe they had losses elsewhere to offset those gains too. So we have to look at a global situation, not necessarily the situation on a given property, but don't, don't uh, you know, try to just spend all the money on something to be totally deferred if that's not what they want. Every dollar more you spend on something than you want costs you a buck. If you don't spend it, maybe it costs you 30 or 40 cents. So this is just, I think, a great example, an extreme example of somebody you know, giving up a you know, $3 million building, getting a million dollar replacement, still saving a quarter million in tax, and that's where they wanted to be. And by the way, they ultimately moved into this property years later. Tick foreclosure, phantom gain situation. Uh, what happened? This was a, a Tennessee in common series of limited liability companies, all Tennessee in common owners of the asset. Pre foreclosure, the assignment of membership interests went from our client to us. So we were the member of the LLC when the property is foreclosed. The clock starts when that assignment of membership interest occurs. So as soon as they assign the membership interest, when the property was foreclosed, it's really irrelevant. The transfer to us is what starts the clock. And uh, so they gave us the property. We end up, uh, you know, the property's foreclosed. We shelter them, isolate them from that actual or constructive receipt of phantom gain. And the taxpayer goes out and buys a new property of equal or greater value to what the debt was on the relinquished property. So, you know, in this situation, a lot of times, as I said earlier, if they if they just lose the foreclosure and, and pay the tax, they get nothing. And a lot of times that tax obligation is beyond what they would have to come out of pocket making the acquisition. And you might say, well, gee, you know, their, their credit's destroyed because it was a foreclosure. Well, no, it wasn't because these are institutionally offered uh, fractional ownership assets, non-recourse debt. So it did not do anything for the taxpayer as far as their credit worthiness. So we've got lots of transactions, unfortunately, in recessionary times where we don't even get any money on a disposition and the taxpayer is just showing up at the acquisition of the replacement with the money required to buy the property. And in this example, the funds required to buy the replacement were actually less than what came out as proceeds of the relinquished property. Throwing a curveball at you. This is a teaser. I want you to come back and listen to the retirement side. 
So these people, you never know what's going on. These people came into us, their first call, they wanted to go out and buy a mobile home RV park with a retirement account. We said, okay, fine, we're gonna do something called a checkbook IRA that allows them to go out and get that thing. Well, what ultimately happened is not that. I mean, ultimately, they did not do a checkbook IRA because what they told us after we started you know, looking into it and structuring the transaction for them, started getting to the details is they wanted to be the onsite managers and so they wanted to live there and have a job. Well, that all of that would trigger prohibited transaction clauses and and end up treating all funds in that IRA. That, that would be a prohibited transaction and convert the entire account to a taxable situation. We didn't want that to happen, obviously, neither did they. So we shifted gears from a checkbook IRA into what's called a rollover business startup. And what's great about this transaction is we moved their IRAs, husband and wife, they moved, we moved each of their IRAs into the new 401k plan. The 401k plan bought the C-Corp, the C-Corp bought the park, and these people got an investment. They got a job and a place to live all in that one transaction. And I always like to say, I think that's a pretty amazing solution uh, to provide and, and very happy clients, which is the most important thing. So the end games, swap until you drop. Uh, use that while it's here. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, as uh, you know, our experts are sort of, sort of expecting tax uh, tax planning with the Biden administration to come later rather than sooner. But you know, who knows in this crazy world? So swap till you drop. Use that while you can. Exchange into a retirement residence. We do that a lot. Exchange until it makes tax sense. What do we mean by that? Well. Maybe last year you had a lot of gains. Maybe next year you have losses. Sell when your gains are, 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 you know, can offset with losses or maybe you're making less money. So that's a tax planning issue and you're going to talk to your tax people about that. Exchange into a passive investment. DSTs, uh, some tenancy in common. Uh, the difference between DSTs and tenancy in common these days, DSTs are typically multi-asset. Some of them are single but uh, it's a different structure. Both qualify for 1031, but it's a, it's a stable asset. Tennessee and common structured uh, projects typically are something where it's, it's a, you know, a, a project that's under maybe development. I don't mean necessarily being built, but it's a value add play. Installment sales can be an end game. Uh, you know, pay the tax as you receive the principal payments. Just be aware that you're going to have tax exposure on debt relief and depreciation recapture in the year of disposition, whether you receive the principal payment or not. Structured sale is the same as an installment sale. A structured sale is just an institutionally structured installment sale. So what's the problem with an installment sale? You could have the buyer, uh, you know, default. You could have the buyer accelerate the loan. Maybe they, you know, they they want to refi the thing and stop paying you. Uh, you know, you're eight, nine, ten percent, and then go pay three percent someplace else. So just be aware that a structured sale allows you to get out of that, have installment sale treatment, literally over the term you want. Deferred sales trusts really are are the same sort of structure as a structured sale. Understand that they have not, you know, necessarily had the blessing of the the IRS yet, but that's uh, you know something that's out there. Deferred sales trust is actually a trademark term. Uh, you know, we just uh, reference them as a DST also. CRT, Charitable Remainder Trust. Well, you've got something you don't want, you want to give it to some charity, that would be using a CRT. If you've got uh, interest in that, we've got a, a series of videos on that also. Uh, Providence, Guy Lon Dufex, uh, somebody that does a lot of that for Providence, he's in their giving department. Uh, gifting assets too. We a lot of have a lot of people that go out and buy things and gift to the next generation. Understand, like I said, when you're gifting something, if you're gifting a property, you're gifting the equity. So be aware of the fifteen thousand. Uh, at least that's the that's the limit these days for gifting without tax exposure. Uh, understand also if you're gifting of minority interest in something, that number could be discounted. So. IRA Advantage uh, for retirement accounts. You or your clients have questions or needs on that stuff. Post 1031, you might want a place to get further exposure for your property listings. You can put them on there. And then 1031exchange.com. We're all wrapped up. I want to thank you very much for your time today. Uh, more than anything, I just want to encourage you to reach out anytime you've got questions. Even if you're working with somebody else, we're here to answer your questions. Uh, we're the guys with the answers and and uh, you know the other thing we like to say is you know you or your clients have worked hard for their money and we work hard to keep it theirs or yours 
But uh, thank you very much and a better new year to everybody. And I look forward to seeing people's faces and getting into rooms again. I miss this. It's nice to nice to have a you know a larger audience in many cases, but I do miss seeing seeing everybody's smiling faces. And I knew do miss seeing those hands go up and addressing those questions live. So thank you very much. And uh, hey, have a wonderful year. And we will uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.